So, hi, my name's Pete Fine. Um, uh, I go by Pete Wears Pants on Twitter. I have this blog at website at iwearpants.org or i.wearpants.org. Um, I don't actually tweet all that much, but you know, it's good to have a Twitter account. Um, I am an agent uh, with a group called Telecomics. Uh, we are an ad hoc internet-based cluster of what most people seem to call these days be calling hacktivists, um, that we have mixed feelings about that term. Um, this is our cool logo. Uh, when you think of hacktivists, you probably think of anonymous because they get a lot of media attention. Um, but there's a long history of using computers and the internet in particular, um, and technology generally, to facilitate communication and freedom. Um, everybody from Cult of the Dead Cow, the cypherpunk movement. Uh, and if you think of hacking, uh, a little more broad, hacktivism a little more broadly, you might throw groups in there like WikiLeaks or the Yes Men kind of as more media hackers. Um, telecomics is in that broad tradition that we have more of a cypher hippie twist. Um, this is our homepage. Uh, and it describes us as a socio cybernetic telecommunist cluster of internet and data loving bots and people always striving to protect and improve the internet and defend the free flow of data. Telecomics, just like the internet, knows no borders, technological or territorial. Um, we are mainly, uh, you know, so we're just kind of a network of friends. We're just a group of people, we hang out. Um, there's no mailing address, we don't take any money at all. Uh, there's no bank account, there's no formal members, there's no leaders. Uh, you don't get a cool badge or anything like that. Um, uh, what we are uh, is an IRC network, mainly. Um, can we play the hand game? Everybody put your hand up. Everybody come up, put your hand up. Um, if you don't, if you've never used IRC, put your hand down. Okay, that's awesome. <laughs> it's like three times higher percentage than any room I've ever given this talk to you before. Uh, if you've never used a network besides Freenode, put your hand down. Wow, okay. If you're on IRC right now, uh, don't put, no, uh, don't put your hand up. Um, all right. um, anybody run their own server? Wow, all right, awesome. Um, sort of. You heard our Freenode one, okay, that's cool. Um, so telecomics mainly is just this, oh, this didn't work at all, uh, IRC net. Um, it's on our homepage here, which I just lost. Um, and we hang out on IRC, um, and I'd like to, and, and we do stuff. Um, most of what we have done in the last year and a half uh, has earned us the label tech support for the Arab Spring. So we have been pretty actively involved in trying to keep the internet running throughout the Middle East, uh, Egypt, Iran, Libya, Bahrain, uh, and been very active in Syria for the last ooh, nine months or so. Um, I can give you a little tour. We offer people all sorts of different services. Um, we have pads. Uh, this one is from a talk I did at uh, Mozilla. Uh, we provide DNS, a whole bunch of kind of different tools to help people use the internet in cool and constructive ways. Um, largely, telecomics is like kind of a place to pl hang out and play with technology. Um, uh, kind of like Nauticon or your local hacker space. Um, and to sort of help out your friends. Um, the people who hang out here have really complementary skills. Uh, I'm good at talking, and other people are good at like bash and nmap, which I'm not. Um, There's a wide variety of folks who are, we call ourselves agents, uh, agents of telecomics. Um, personally, I'm a Python programmer, is my background. Um, and there are a lot of pen testers and network admins. Um, but there's also university professors and pirates and politicians and punks and protesters, both in the States and overseas. Um, we call ourselves internauts. Um, in, in the sense of an astronaut or an argonaut, kind of that we're explorers and adventurers. Um, and yeah, the other, the other term, oh, does this go down? Oh, typo. Uh, we like is uh, data lovers. This is gonna work. Uh, 
Um, this is another kind of one of our propaganda sites we put together. Uh, yeah. Basically, the idea that sort of there sh should be you know free and open data and access to it on the internet. Um, we think that's cool. Um, okay. Uh, I'm actually going to encourage people. Um, oh, hold on! I totally got out of order. Um, get past this thing. Mm -hmm. So. One of the other best descriptions I've heard for what telecomics is and what we do uh, came from somebody who works on Tor, um, but more on the like policy side, strangely enough. Um, she described the Internet Emergency Response Plan as so. Uh, get a bunch of technically competent people together. Uh, the Emergency plans plan Response Plan looks something like get people who know what they are doing together in an IRC channel and get stuff done. Um, but I'm not sure the political scientists are familiar with that much competence in the same place. Uh, I was actually at uh, a conference at Yale Law School, oh, maybe about two weeks ago, where there were a bunch of lawyers and political scientists, and I don't think they got it. But maybe you guys do, and so that's what I'm, I'm hoping for. Um, because we're hackers. Right? Like I've traveled all over the world in the last year and a half to talk about the work we've done. And trying to explain like, how stuff actually works in an IRC network, like organizing a conference or a software project, to like, people who have never worked in that way, where kind of people just show up and you just kind of do stuff, is remarkably hard. Like, I think we get it. I hope we get it. Um, but yeah. Um, I use the word hack here in its original technical sense. Um, we've talked a lot about different things that it means. Um, but for me, it just means a clever technical trick or using a system in a way its designer didn't intend. In a lot of ways, for me, it's like a mindset. Um, like, how the heck does this thing work and what else can I do? You know, uh, and there's a level of adaptability that kind of comes along with that. Like, I was out riding my bike once, and you know, some part broke, and so I fixed it with a stick. Like that kind of attitude towards the world, I think, is really captures what it means to be a hacker. Um, all right, I'm just going to kind of move on and talk about more interesting stuff here. Um, <coughs> telecomics hacks all sorts of things. Um, Sorry. Um, you know, we don't just hack like we're not. We hack in what I think is the constructive sense. So like we don't DDoS servers, we don't leak emails, we don't like deface websites. Um, we try to try to be, I think, more kind of the flip side of that coin of making stuff and building stuff and doing stuff. Um, and we do that not to just help people overthrow repressive governments, but in all sorts of different places. Like, we hack policy, and we hack the media by getting them to pay attention to us um, and pay attention to the stories that we hear. Um, I was originally going to ask people, you know, like, we have all, like, to treat sort of this entire talk as kind of a collaborative hack, um, that we have all this cool technology right in front of us, like, uh, laptops and cell phones and stuff. And so if I don't actually have anything in particular, like I don't really have slides, um, but if folks want to either tweet or log on our IRC server, uh, it's irc.telecomics.org, um, there's an icon channel. Um, and if you just have questions too, um, if you just want to ask for comments or whatever, and I'm just going to tell some stories about what the heck I've been up to during that time. Um, sound good? Um, if you also want to like read your email or look at porn or kittens, like I'll totally understand. Uh, okay. uh, I got involved in telecomics on about January 23rd, um, so about two or three days before the start of the Egyptian Revolution. Um, there was some pretty active filtering to the Egyptian internet during that time. Uh, we would help people set up VPNs um, just out of machines hosted in 
people's apartments uh, or you know machines under their control. Uh, a lot of our guys are European. A lot of Swedes in particular, there's much higher internet speeds uh, at home, and so they're able to run services like that in a way that we kind of can't really do in the States. Um, we would get folks from Egypt uh, on our IRC network who couldn't access Twitter themselves because it was blocked. And we would take reports from them uh, about what was happening in their neighborhood or just you know, how they're feeling about stuff, uh, and we would tweet on their behalf. Um, so that's the kind of facilitation that we try to do. Um, telecomics is not just people. There's a real like humans and machines here. That sort of it's not just about setting up a tour bridge and then telling somebody to have a nice day. It's, it's sort of about ha helping folks to kind of actively use that. And I think this kind of Twitter facilitation really captures that nicely. Um, and so, I don't know if folks have seen this graph board. This is a traffic graph coming out of Egypt. And you can basically see at some point on, I don't know, it's like the 20, morning of the 28th, they just pull the plug. They pull the plug. They didn't actually physically cut the fiber because that would be expensive and incredibly fucking stupid. Um, but they went to the ISPs and said, turn it off. Just turn it off. Uh, and that was really a shock, even to us. I mean, we were in the thick of it. But to think that a country would completely cut itself off from the global communications network as much as it was able to, was really kind of unprecedented. Kind of just like, what the fuck? Like, what the fuck do we do now? You know? Um, we went back to some old, like, 1980s technology. Uh, we used dial up modems. Uh, we put together about 500 dial up modem lines across the world. Uh, European ISPs and individual users, we wrote a how to uh, and kind of spam that out for people to dial up and get some internet access. Uh, about 60% of Egyptian users were on dial-up before the revolution anyway. It was about 20% Wi-Fi, 20% wired, 60%. So that hardware is already there. Um, the other thing we did is we sent fax spam. Like we Googled up the phone numbers of fax machines and coffee shops and universities and like hospitals uh, and sent a fax with messages of support and communications advice and practical stuff like treatments for tear gas to all these fax machines that we could find, just using free internet faxing services. Uh, we know the, the tear gas stuff worked particularly well. Uh, more cool things we tried. We tried, had a ham radio operation. Uh, that got up to about 130 people in that channel alone. Um, that didn't actually succeed. Like, we didn't actually make contact with anybody on the ground in Egypt. Um, we can talk about more about why if people care about ham. Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, there were probably about 130, 140 licensed hams in all of Egypt. Uh, most of those were probably ex-military. Um, there's like 83 million people in the country. Uh, you know, there's like 2 million ham licensed hams worldwide. Uh, just chatting with people, like the best guess of folks with regular access to equipment is probably 50,000, maybe 100,000 people. So it's like kind of a, uh, for folks who don't know, it's, it's a technology that with like a 200 watt transmitter, which is like what you have in your home stereo, you can cover a quarter of the globe. So like we were trying to listen for Egypt from, you know, the east coast of the United States. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just, just coordinating. So a lot of what I do is just coordinating people and like getting people to, to work together. So like, I'm not actually a ham. Um, you know, I just was hanging out and somebody said, hey, should we try ham radio? And I just kind of have like an intellectual interest in pirate radio and, and such things. And so I just kind of like ran around the internet and found people who wanted to help. Like I ran over the ham radio ch channel on Freenode. There's like one or two other ones on some other star chat, I think. I don't remember exactly. Like I spammed forums um, and just just tried to recruit people and then kind of say like, okay, like what do we actually need to, to do here? Um, 
Some cool project ideas. Oh, that was the other thing. Is like I totally forgot. Um, project ideas came out of this. Like some folks were talking about making a ham to Twitter gateway. Um, so well, in some sense, the project wasn't was a failure in that we didn't make contact with anybody in Egypt. Um, you know, just in terms of breathing some life back into that community and kind of opening up some new debates about the involvement and kind of political stuff and, um, did come out of it. Um, more cool projects, just because, I don't know, it's fun to talk like about the geeky stuff a little bit um, that I don't usually get to. Uh, we ran a project after, uh, at this point, you know, like January 28th, January 29th, to the guys like Nmap the entire Egyptian IP address space in about 36 hours. If you think about how long it would normally take to Nmap a whole country, it's like a few weeks, right? Because it's a lot of IPs. But there were so few machines up, they found about 5,000 of them. That it only took took a handful of hours. Um, we found like printers and like one or two cameras. Um, what we did with this is they wrote some scripts to inject human readable messages into the web server logs. So we do something like get, we are telecomics, get, we are, come from the internet, get, we come in peace, like get, dial up, you know, phone number like one, two, three, four, five, whatever. Um, how much of those actually got received? I don't know. It's hard to tell sometimes. Like you spam things like that and you can't tell what gets picked up. But it's cool. Like I think that's what. What I sometimes don't get to talk about is just this kind of, as a, a geek and a hacker, like how technologically fun this stuff can be. Like, you know, just this attitude of like, oh shit, they broke the whole fucking internet for this country. Like, can we fix it? <laughs> you know? Um, all right. Uh, let's. Is anybody using IRC at all? I totally forgot about it. Uh, some folks. Okay, that's cool. Um, I have mainly, so the world moved on, right? Egypt ended, the world moved on. Um, since then, though, oh, we have been super busy in Syria. Um, oops, sorry. We started our Syria operations July of last year. Uh, we started doing network scans. We had root on a box and a ground contact inside three days uh, from when we started that. That's like less time than it's taken some conferences to buy me fucking plane tickets. <laughs> you know, like for a system in which nobody's actually in charge, and nobody's giving orders, like we're remarkably fast and we're remarkably effective and like we're all volunteers, nobody gets paid, like if you just flake out in the middle, like, you know, that sucks, but you know, like there's nobody gonna come and yell at you or anything like that. Um, you know, like we get a remarkable amount of stuff done. Um, We run a couple of sites to sort of, oh, here, let me pop up, um, to kind of the news that we see. So we have Syrians on our IRC network uh, every day on a regular basis. Some of these guys we've been working with um, for six months. Um, we have no idea who they are. We don't want to know. Um, you know, that's part of the way in which we keep people safe. Uh, Oh, so this is this is our Syria channel. It's probably going to be pretty quiet. Um, I talked about telecomics being this cluster of humans and machines. Um, II is this bot um, that uh, does translation for us. So we have people. We'll get people come and t who mainly speak Arabic into this IRC channel, and we have some human agents who are capable of translating either through French or you know people who speak French. Uh, a lot of a lot of folks there too, um, but the bot helps too. We've come up with a couple of different sites, and it's sort of been a struggle to kind of get the news uh, that we receive through these channels like out to the world. Um, right? That's kind of what we want to do to facilitate communication. We've set up a few interviews with the mainstream press. Um, it's been difficult. The the U.S. the European press is a little better, but the U.S. press in particular doesn't want to wants real names. 
insists on real names. Like, I could give them somebody in Detroit on a Skype connection who speaks Arabic and tell them they're in Syria, and they won't know. But, you know, you talk to these people, and some of them will actually, uh, generally not Skype, but will use IRC or have email accounts. Um, some people will use Skype uh, for 10 minutes, and you know they're in Syria. And I won't, we won't tell you where, we won't tell you your name, but um, I don't know, I guess that's journalist for you. Uh, so we run this news site. Um, and so this is, again, accessible from the bot, and this is kind of, we just tweet out news about what happens, everything from uh, network connections to, uh, you know, news from, the, news from the ground about protests and stuff like that. Um, the guys also built Somebody downloading like lots of movies or something right now? No. All right, let's try. Find something interesting. Okay. Um, oh wow, that's interesting. So like all sorts of stuff that we kind of put out. Like here's some document from the Syrian government detailing all the specs of their internet backbone. That sounds cool. Um, <laughs> All sorts of stuff we find. Um, the hands-on work uh, will involve helping people set up with Tor, VPNs, um, other kinds of encryption, PGP, uh, OTR for instant messenger chat. Uh, what? Uh, we do use ITP a little bit, too. Um, we'll run some dark nets internally. Um, so like that pad I showed you earlier is a collaborative editor. Um, you know, some of the guys threw get together a dark net kind of that has some services for, you know, a kind of more handful of trusted Syrians. I don't actually know what's up in that much. Like, nobody consults with me, you know. They just go do things, and if I happen to notice and it's cool, like, I can talk about it. But there's a lot of stuff that goes on that I don't know about. Um, and that's part of, part of, I guess, our OPSEC. You know, that if we have a Syrian who's new and shows up and he needs a VPN, we don't discuss that in a public channel, right? Like with like 30 or 50 people. You remember like back in the day, like, you know, when you would go cyber, you wouldn't like do that in a public chat. Only you'd go with like, you know, two or three buddies and set up a VPN in a private, a private channel. Um, and so everything is on a very much a need to know basis. Uh, because this channel is totally public. Uh, we get uh, journalists, we get lurkers, we know it's logged. Um, we get people who are occasionally curious about uh, who we are and where we're from, we're pretty sure those are Syrian government agents. And so just kind of, when we get somebody we want to help out, we get them set up technologically and kind of give them an intro to OPSEC and then kind of bring them back in. And we want them to participate. Let's see if this came up at all. No. Everything's broke. What is that? I have this nice site I would like to show you. What the heck? This one. Um, I don't know why it's not working. Uh, one, let's try it one more place. Um, one of the projects we put together is a collection of videos. Uh, it's about 500 of them. It's six or seven gigs at this point of stuff that's passed through this channel. Um, here we go. <laughs> uh, this originally started just as a listing on an Apache directory. Um, this is everything, this is basically stuff that we have helped people publish um, or people have brought to our attention. Um, and there's a really nice site called Syrian Stories which seems to be down right now. Uh, we partnered with some journalists to kind of help give this a little better. Should we watch stuff? Should we find stuff that's not horrible? No, let's skip it. Um, let's see what else I had here to talk about. Uh, oh, you guys will love this. Um, we'll be pr more proactive sometimes. 
this is a page uh, that we used in, we've done it once or twice, but the first time was last September, this past September. We hijacked a significant portion of the traffic coming out of Syria. Um, and so somebody would try to access google.com or facebook.com, and they would instead get this page. Uh, which was a message about um, surveillance and then a link to some tools about how to actually get around that. Um, so last you know, July, we started doing some network scans. We kind of started picking up on getting a sense of sort of what the heck was going on in terms of network surveillance there. And then trying to like, proactively provide tools to people to keep themselves safe. So that kind of hijack, like that's a hack, but that's like really a different use for those sort of skills than like man in the middle or like just defacing a website. Um, you know, that we're really able to use this to help people not get arrested and hit in the head. Okay. Uh, all right, one of the other things we discovered with lots of end mapping, anybody heard of blue coat? Name ring me bells. Blue Coat is a company that makes deep packet inspection hardware. And we found about a dozen of their machines in Syria. Um, and uh, just on Nmap scans, we found some FT open FTP servers. And over the course of six weeks on these totally public FTP servers, like didn't even need to guess a password, um, logs, out, logs out of these, these things. Um, and so these are basically forced, they're capable of doing, what we found were HTTP logs, um, which is probably about 90% of the traffic they're seeing. But they're wire speed devices running, you know, they run at the speed of the fiber using a custom ASIC, ASIC to do deep packet inspection. The manufacturer claims that they're able to tell the difference between updates to your Facebook wall and Farmville, and then not just outright block Farmville, but slow it down. Because that way, as an employee in your company, like, you just won't want to play. Like, you'd get pissed off if they blocked it outright. But if it's just slow, like, you go, OK, fine, you go back to your job. Um, it's a fairly sophisticated technical distinction. Um, we found the HTTP logs out of these things. So basically, these are like enhanced Apache logs. So the source IP, the destination IP, like URLs, uh, what URL people are trying to get, uh, host name, stuff like that. Um, for like all of the like like all of the ISPs in the country, um, we poked around with these for a while, um, and then guys eventually released it. I found out about it on IRC five minutes before it got leaked on Twitter, because uh, again, people just like nobody told me. But I wrote a story about it on Slashdot, and the company denied it. They outright denied that there was any evidence that this was their hardware, that there was any evidence these machines were in Syria. We're like, line two of the header says blue coat. Like, stop, stop bullshitting us. Um, what eventually happened was a couple of uh, the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal uh, picked up the story. And it turned out the machines were phoning home. Uh, that they phone home not only for to, to Blue Code's headquarters, not only for software updates, but for collaborative filtering. So if they saw some weird traffic passing over the wire that they couldn't analyze locally, they'd send a sample of it home, and within like 200 or 500 milliseconds, uh, Blue Code's like cluster back at HQ, which is pooling this weird traffic globally, would try to give it some sort of categorization. That's like creepy enough, right? That there's like all, and there's a lot of these things out there. Like that, that this company is sniffing and sort of pooling like interesting traffic across the globe, um, but yeah, when you then sort of use it in Syria to like really restrict, we found that like proxy was being blocked as a keyword, Israel was being blocked as a keyword, a whole range of sites, about ten percent of Facebook pages, um, but not entirely Facebook.com. There was a period where uh, you could browse YouTube, but you couldn't upload, and there's kind of all these kind of sort of fine-grained settings that kind of these devices are capable of. Um, the company actually eventually admitted that this was their hardware. Um, they also said that they weren't looking at their own logs. 
which I can believe, right? So these, these devices phone home and presumably they keep internal logs of who's getting their patches and using their collaborative services. And they just claim that they weren't looking at all. Now, as, as I can believe that, like, as, as what's, you know, probably like, both just as sort of like lazy system administrators, but also they have a real incentive not to. Because this kind of equipment, you know, like causes huge media outcry. Like they have an incentive not to know where this kind of censorship and surveillance gear goes. Um, because it's really bad press for them when it winds up in Syria. The upshot of all of this, aside from the fact that they, you know, got publicly shamed, um, was the EU passed export controls on this type of equipment to Syria in particular. Um, and so some of the telecomics guys, like I said, work on the policy side or kind of more <coughs> politicians. Like a lot of our guys are European and they work in the European Parliament. Uh, uh, worked on some of that too. And so this is kind of really, I think, telecomics at its best. Like all the way from you know, Nmap scans through kind of getting the media to pay attention through it by writing a slash dot story at first, um, to actual policy change, like to actual real world change. Um, this is kind of the cool stuff that like we can do as hackers to make our world better. Uh, and that I think in some ways is a lot of it about what telecoms is about. Um, let's see. Anybody have questions about DPI? No? Yeah. Okay. <sighs> Get into that. Um, at, at like the infrastructure level, I think it's probably a little late for that. I don't know if people saw like the NSA is building this huge, huge data center in Utah to like store all of the internet traffic. Um, you know, like, and, and stuff like that. Telecom's attitude here, like, we work on the policy side. Like, personally, I'm not interested in mainstream politics at all. Uh, but I don't think we, um, trust governments, like, to respect our rights, to respect our rights to privacy, to not survey all of our communications, to not block websites for whatever stupid reason to sure they come up with. Uh, and so one of the things we do is we build tools. Um, Telecomics runs cryptoanarchy.org, which is a big wiki of kind of tools and tactics and how to's on uh, awesome. uh, creating uh, autonomous zones, basically carving out space using strong cryptography where kind of we can be free from government censorship and surveillance. The other way we can, can other thing that kind of came out of Syria that sort of relates to your question is this project we have called Blue Cabinet, which is a collection of docs, basically. Uh, pick some interesting ones. Um, on, oh, I think it's like two or 300 different companies that make software and censorship hardware and surveillance gear. Um, it's like this huge list and sort of all certain, this is the one on Checkpoint, and there's like dozens of companies. Um, just as a way of sort of starting to get a handle on who the heck is out there and who's actually selling this and what this gear is capable of. Uh, and so this is a public wiki. Um, our wiki is at rerebuild.telecomics.org. Um, oh, I'll get through all those things at the end. Um, I think the next lead, this is actually a decent lead into um, the other thing Telecomics was involved in. Um, you know, we blocked out our site like SOPA. I think the SOPA protests was the start of the internet starting to exercise its um, muscle a little bit in defense of itself. Like, this wasn't like the internet, you know, we've seen the internet rallying up for like particular causes like save this cat or, you know, don't pollute this river. But we haven't really seen it like quite to this degree like rally up in self-defense of the media. It's kind of cool. Um, Um, telecom, I mean, so, so we weren't super involved in the SOPA protests, uh, but we were pretty active uh, for ACTA. Um, people know what ACTA is. It's this big copyright treaty in Europe, and there are these enormous protests, like just these huge, huge protests. Um, let's see if I can find some good 
pictures here. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm awesome. And so Telcomics kind of served as this like global block back channel to the act of protests. Um, this is this is some photos from Stockholm. Um, so we had a channel about 20 or 30 people. Um, about half of them were Polish, uh, because Poland is awesome. We can talk about more about why, because uh, that's where the, the act of protest kind of really really kicked off. Uh, with folks from Polish NGOs, um, weird hacktivists hiding out in their internet fortresses in Chicago, like me, uh, European level NGOs, French, um, all the kind of a range of different. People, some people more on the like public interest group policy side, where we basically just kind of hung out and sort of coordinated strategy and kind of chatted. Um, it was really quiet actually most of the time because we were all so busy. But this this is this, like when I talk about tall comics as a network of friends, like it's all these people who are like really into the internet and like making the, an awesome internet and like so. Yeah, like it's sort of a natural place for that kind of low level but sort of important organization to go on. And like again, like there's no like this is not like a central secret committee. It's just an IRC channel. And it's even a public channel. You just have to know where to look. But it's really just a place where we can hang out and the people who are interested in kind of uh, you know, the the act in particular um, can can hang out and chat and coordinate, right? Because the intellectual property lobby, like, they do that. So like they go off and conspire in back rooms with politicians and shit like that. So why shouldn't we? Right? Um, let's find some cool pictures. One of the cool thing and so there we go. Um, so most of the pictures people probably saw, right? So huge protests, huge, huge protests. Um, a lot of the pictures, right? I mean, you probably saw were at non. We can kind of talk about the relationship between non and telecomics here a little bit. Um, one of the things that kind of came out of this was telecomics also was the IRC channel host at least uh, for what was something in Poland called debata acta, uh, which means acta debate. And so Poland had all these protests and had them really early, and like lots of people, like lots and lots of people, um, uh, in the cold and uh, uh, showing up um, to protest against not only I think the restriction, you know, what the perceived censorship, but also the process. Like people just couldn't. I've talked to talked to folks. People just couldn't believe. That this treaty was going to pass, like that nobody knew about it, right? Like some of us might have known about it, but we're geeks and we care about like IP and intellectual property and copyright. But like just average folks in Europe, Europe who like, you know, showed up like all of these places in the like thousands. Um, the outrage was not just like hands off my internet, but also I think frustration at the secrecy of the process. Um, just that this would, was about to pass, and people had no idea. They had no like, how the heck could that happen? Like, how could they go behind our back and do this? I think I think the much the similar with the austerity protests in Greece, uh, where people just feel like their governments are kind of totally out of touch. Um, one of the cool things that came out of this in Poland was uh, this event called Debata Acta, which just means act to debate, but. Poland, the Polish prime minister like sat down with his country's internet, like on Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus and IRC because they they thought those other services weren't open enough, um, and for seven hours had this debate. Uh, it was broadcast like 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 on a, a a live audience like with with the stuff projected up. It was broadcast on national TV uh, for most of most of the day. Uh, seven hours about ACTA and the future of the internet in Poland. Like, that's awesome. It's awesome. Just as, as you know, an exercise in direct democracy or kind of participatory democracy of the sort that 
Occupy Wall Street, I think, is trying to do, or I think the kind of try the model we try to run our hacker spaces on. Um, yeah, it's really, really cool. <laughs> What actually, I mean, and so what's, what's actually coming out of this is that the Polish Prime Minister, I totally lost my tab, that's cool, um, eventually uh, backpedaled and sent a letter to all the other European heads of state, like the President and the Prime Ministers, and urging them to reject this thing. And it is looking like it's going to die. Um, there's an interesting question here of like, why did Europeans hit the streets? over ACTA and Americans hit reload on Wikipedia over SOPA. Like, remember that, right? Like, all these high school kids, like, after the blackout, like, Twitter just lights up with, like, what the fuck, Wikipedia? I can't do my homework. So it's hitting reload. Um, that's a complex and interesting question. Interestingly, nobody got tear gassed at the ACTA protests, you know? Like, and I think that says a lot about Europe. Um, I don't know. How am I doing on time? Is any... Questions? Can I take any questions? Comments? No? Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's, sure, we can talk about Mesh Network. Um, I think Mesh Networking is really cool. Um, I think uh, it's potentially a, a sort of interesting technology. Like, everybody's really hopped up on it right now because of the sort of centralization of our communication infrastructure. I don't know. I don't know. I feel like, you know, if the idea is like we run a mesh and everybody can share the internet, we could have it open and everybody can just, like, it's free and it's cool. Like, I don't know, you go down, walk down the street, like, certainly in San Francisco or New York, and I, I suspect parts of Cleveland too, there's just like, you can easily see what? A dozen, 20, 30 networks that are accept like, and they're all locked. They're all locked. We can have an open internet today. We can have an open internet today if we wanted to. If people just unlocked their router and said, like, okay, you know, and there's obviously some technical complications like that, like somebody, you know, hacksering your, you know, Apple Music server or something like that. But really, like, we treat this as a scarce resource, both. Like, at the IP level, I don't know if people were around for the IPv4 talk before, like, in our hoarding of our Wi-Fi. Um, and the spectrum, too. Um, like, these things are not, not scarce. Like, I think mesh spectrum, like, mesh networks are a way to try to address that. You know, I don't know. Um, I think, like, there needs to be work on the policy side as well, and that's been really hard. Like, the FCC is auctioning off all of the old analog TV spectrum for 4G services. Like, that's awesome prime spectrum. It goes through walls, it goes through glass, it goes through people, it doesn't get brain cancer, it's really high bandwidth. And, like, this natural resource, which isn't scarce at all, like, got sold off to AT&T and Verizon, where they're going to turn around and sell it back to us to provide shitty 4G service. Okay. Like, <laughs> you know, like, that's not censorship in a strict sense, but, like, I don't know. I think Spectrum is speech. And, like, they just freaking took, took it all away from us and sold it. Like, yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, you know, in my ideal world, it's ours to use. Like, I think that there needs to be some way of sorting out, like, people not stomping each other's toes. But... For the only solution to be to just sell that off seems really inefficient. I'd like to be the more space for people to experiment. I'd like to be more space like for people to hack and play around, you know, not with just no ways of communicating like over IP, but over some of the like lower level modes, like, you know, whether that's actual circuit bending or, you know, like the dudes at the ham radio subspace. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not enough of a <sighs> Wi-Fi or Spectrum geek to actually have a good technical answer. It just bothers me. <laughs> um, yeah, totally. Um, let me see if I can find. So, my goal here in coming to give this talk is to sort of get people 
like one, because this stuff is cool, but also to get people inspired. Like, I go around and I do these talks, and I've like literally been all over the world, and it gets really tiring. Um, and like, not because I'm looking for attention. Like, fuck credit. I don't care. I don't care. Like, I do this stuff because I believe in it. Um, and I go around, I talk about it because I'm looking to inspire people. Like, you know, just to think differently about free speech in a digital age, but also at like, what I'm hoping you hear at like a more technical level. And so if people are cool, I wouldn't mind going through some of just kind of the project ideas we've come across in the last like year and a half, see if people get excited about them. Um, on the circuit bendy front, um, we came up during Egypt with a, a plan, what we call the AMFM plan, was basically, trying to build analog radios out of repurposed consumer electronics. People in the developing world are amazingly resourceful. I don't know if folks have seen some of the videos out of Libya where they like mounted, you know, like reclaimed like anti-aircraft, you know, anti-aircraft guns on power wheels and then used to like with a remote control or they like rig, rigged a doorbell as a firing mechanism. People are remarkably, remarkably resourceful in some of these places. Um, and so we were trying to come up with how-tos, like another form of a care package, like leaving somebody a zip file with Tor or Firefox plugins, or like a fax care package, but like using kind of our time and our technical knowledge to come up with how-tos for people to build stuff on the ground with the equipment they already have. Like telecomics doesn't do ground ops. We don't plan protests, we don't do anything violent, like we don't ship hardware, like we don't ship, we don't do sat phones. Like, it's hard, it's expensive, you have to know how to send it to. Uh, so like, if what you want, you know, like what can we build with what's, what's already there? Um, one of the things we came up with but didn't finish was building two-way radios, basically walkie-talkies out of repurposed consumer electronics. Um, I am not, I don't even know how to solder. But apparently, if you take two like alarm clock radios and smash them open and cross like three wires, um, you have one unit of a walkie-talkie. Um, and if you build a couple of these, uh, you know, you can get maybe a mile, like two kilometer range, so like a mile and a half, which if you're looking to organize in Tahrir Square, it's probably awesome, right? Um, yeah, do you have it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Like the use of old technology here, like is is just you know, like the internet is made of glue and popsicle sticks. It's not actually a bad thing, because that means when it breaks, like we can go get some more glue and go get some more popsicle sticks and go fix it. <laughs> you know, like whether that's with modems or or IRC or or whatever. Um, okay, uh, some more. Projects. Um, oh gosh, these are all too boring. These, these things are all really boring. So, visually, um, I am actually not a huge fan of mesh nets for the developing world. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that I hate the Freedom Box. Um, I think that free, I mean, people with the Freedom Box, it's like a plug computer that can maybe take a monitor and a keyboard and does mesh networking, and you just plug it in. It's like a hundred bucks, and it ships with Linux and all this awesome stuff and. Um, it's kind of in the design phase, and it's going to solve like all the world's problems. Like, I'm glad like that that's a development effort, but that's a very Western-oriented approach to solving these problems. Like, you know, your problem is you need secure communication or redundant, reliable internet, and so let's make a product. Let's make something else we can sell, like sell the developing world. Like, like I said, I'm a really you know like for a hundred bucks, like that's a lot of money, in even somewhere like Egypt. Uh, 
um, which is relatively wealthy. Um, like I said, I'm a really big fan of what you're already there. Um, and, and also sort of just throwing out what you don't need. Like, if you're trying to organize your city, you don't need the global internet. If you're trying to organize your neighborhood, you don't need the global internet. Like, you don't need Facebook, maybe even to organize your whole country. <laughs> um, one of the ideas we came up with and this, like, was uh, a project we called Intranets. So basically using a combination of laptops and Wi-Fi routers, already there is nodes with Linux CDs, so nothing to flash, and running Usenet. Anybody remember Usenet? Usenet was like the, yeah, right? Usenet was like, huh? You run a Usenet. Oh, that's awesome. Um, Usenet is like a store and forward forum. Uh, think of like 4chan if you want. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, like uh, that, that easily supports anonymous posting and was made for, designed for disconnected operation. Like back up in the day where you didn't have a full time connection to the net, you had to dial into your local university server and get your news. Right? You would download like all of these messages on a bulletin board. Um, could we uh, could we do something like that, you know, in Syria? Could we do something like put a live CD distribution together and send people out wandering around with a laptop, you know, connected, you know, as an uplink to a, a Linksys node, and it's like your local Usenet delivery, like. You put a web gateway on it, and so grandma can just connect from her Windows PC and read some messages and post new ones. And just put this in a backpack and like send guys out wandering around. They don't even know who each other are, and the nodes just sync up. The nodes just sync up, and you just pass in the night your Usenet messages. We get coverage of Syria. Like, can we, can we set up a, a local communications system for homes, which is a city that's been regularly cut off um, you know, like, the D slams are unplugged. So, like, the DSL lines, we can tell, like, some one of the dudes has access to some router, and you can see that the DSL comes physically unplugged. So can we, like, leverage something locally to try to give those people just communication there and then kind of the outside world? Um, uh, other cool projects if we can get people excited about, we have a project called NMAP All Things. Um, <laughs> Uh, basically, we are, took about a dozen countries that are pretty well known to censor their internet and trying to replicate what we did in Syria. Like, just let's scan these entire networks and see if we can find uh, some, some more. I'm out of time, huh? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, censorship, hardware, surveillance, hardware, stuff like that. Um, I guess the point I want to wrap up here is there is so much stuff to be done here. Like, Telcomics is only like, I don't know, there's probably only like 300 people on the RC at a given time. Like, a lot of it's really cool as a geek. A lot of it is really technical, if that's your thing. But a lot of it's really not technical, too. Like, you know, we, this movement needs writers, and it needs artists, and it needs trolls. And it needs also groups besides us. Like, you know, we got up to about 500 people during Egypt and it almost broke us. Like, that's just too large. Like, we want people to go copy us. If you want to come and hang out and get some ideas and, like, work with us, that's awesome. And if you want to go home and start your own, you know, telecomics node, like, come talk to us first. But, like, if you want to start your own cluster and you want to call it, like, helping puppies because puppies are cool, like, whatever. Like, go do stuff. Go do stuff. Um, I think, for me at least, that is at most what it means to be a hacker. It's just, we don't just sit around and plan, we don't sit around and talk, we build things, we make things. And maybe we can do that to make a better world for ourselves and for people on the other side of the world. So yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs>